Does it really make sense for SaaS companies to A-B test? Whatever the test idea you have, look in your Google Analytics or whatever analytics in your backend system that's showing how many free trial signups you get. How many do you get per month? If the conversion metric you are using that you are testing, the thing you're trying to increase, free trial signups in your example, if that is less than 1,000 a month, I think your time is better spent elsewhere. And if it's less than 500 a month, forget it. If it's less than 200 a month, forget it. Do not waste your time with it. The answer is stop worrying about conversion rate. It doesn't matter that that thing is not high converting channel. This is a more realistic example. And this is true for so many businesses. It's like each channel you should be evaluating in the end in dollars, in sales, in revenue. And then what was the dollars in to create that channel? That's it. Your overall site conversion rate is some blend of all of those channels, but does it matter? We wanted to talk about how most companies shouldn't do A-B testing. And I think that's a completely different narrative than what most people say. If you want to improve conversion rate, oftentimes someone's like, oh, just A-B test this thing. And through working with Davish, who runs a CRO agency, I've kind of learned that more often than not, A-B testing doesn't make sense for your business. And that is not the way that you should think about improving conversions. And I'll let you kind of go into the argumentation why, but yeah, we, we kind of wanted to talk through why AB testing just doesn't make sense for most businesses and maybe some ideas on what to do instead. Yeah. Um, I'm going to answer this very quickly. The answer is statistical significance that the majority of businesses, the majority of pages on your site do not get enough conversions to get a statistically significant result. And I'm gonna add another twist, actual statistical significance. For those of you that have done a little bit of A-B testing, you'll know that like the industry standard is 95% plus of like this little metric that A-B test calculators spit out or tools spit out being like statistical significance. And when it reaches 95, it like bolds it in green and it's like your test is up. That's actually not the only criteria to stop a test. And I'll show an example of an old blog post I did um, showing how you got a 95% plus statistical significance in like two days. Um, I got it out of a tool, but turns out I, I what I know is I actually gave the tool the same URL twice. So it was actually an AA test and it was just noise in the data. So you actually have to wait long enough also. Um, well, and most and, people just don't even haven't there been scenarios where then you've run the same test again and got a different result? A B testing is really hard. And like the biggest thing to make it more reliable is traffic. Our best clients, so the agency Benji's referring to Growth Rock, we now only do A B testing for e commerce companies because we used to do it for SaaS and I was starting to get frustrated at this exact topic, this thing that the majority of SaaS companies don't get enough conversions, demos, signups, whatever, to make a difference. So there's someone, someone in the organization, see, now you got me all worked up, which is like every other episode. It's good. So, so someone in the organization is like, some CMO is hired or whatever, and is like, someone's like, we need to increase our conversion rate from, you know, like traffic to demo or whatever. It's a 2%. We need to get it up. So they're like, hire a CRO firm. And like, in the younger days, like I was like, okay, and, and you can hire them now. Like big firms are ready to take $10,000 a month from you. And they'll be like, sure. And what are they going to test? They're going to go to your like demo sign up page and they're going to test all the cliche stuff you've read about in marketing blogs. If you've read about this, right? They're going to put a testimonial under the form to be like, see, social proof. They're going to reduce the number of form fields, reduce friction. Don't ask about size of company. It's people aren't signing up or whatever. <laughs> like it's like, it's like makes the form cumbersome or something like that. What else are they gonna test? They're gonna test a few different headlines. Like, well, benefit copy, they'll put like three benefits. So it'll be like, sign up for a demo. And then the AB test variation, the B, that, you know, the like account manager or whatever, like comes up with will be like three check marks. And I make fun of this, I have done this. I know, I know all this and I'm passionate about it because I've done it many times and was frustrated with it. And it'll be like three benefits, like saves time like blah, 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 or like cheaper or something, you know, and, uh, and, and they'll run it. 
And the vast majority of time, if they are doing the statistics correctly and responsibility, it will show no difference. And then people will get frustrated. What about um, changing the like, button color from red to green? Yeah. Oh, God. That I don't do because it's just so frustrating. Yeah, you change the button color. Um, I, I will later. I want to ask you few, a few more questions to get the context of because you were the one that approached me and said we should do this episode. And I was like, hell yes, I'm ready for it. But um, I will later go over some examples of statistical significance with a calculator. I'll screen share. I'll read it aloud for people listening on the podcast to give you like exact quantitative examples of like at what traffic and conversion numbers do you get more reliable data. But I want to first explain qualitatively a few more things. The other thing. So, so one, I have just like straight up for a majority of these like sassy businesses, SaaS type businesses, or even a service business that just kind of has the same number of like sign up metrics. We're talking about like, let's say hundreds of sign up or 1000 free trial signups a month even can be hard to get statistically significant data. Let me repeat in case you think I'm saying that incorrectly or I made a mistake. I did not. Even at 1000 free trial signups a month, it is very dubious whether whatever traffic number you get for, by the way, slight misconception, people think statistical significance is a function of traffic. It is not. It is a function of conversions per variation. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I, it took me a while to learn that. Um, and I can show some examples with um, the calculator later for the, for the nerdy part of this episode. Um, even at 1,000 total free trial signups, not, which is like, like, you know, our clients, that's a lot. Most SaaS companies aren't getting anywhere near that. And by the way, if you're a demo-based SaaS, like, good luck, because you're, you're getting 1,000 demo requests a month. Like, if so, I would like to talk to you and see what your channels are, right? But even at that, it's hard, because you need to do an A-B test, and it'll be 500 conversions per variation, and you could see a difference, and we'll work through some examples of like how big of a difference you need to see, but in many cases, you're not going to see a statistical difference if it's like you know, 5% lift. It's really hard to get that. And then here's the qualitative reason behind all of this. These things that I'm making fun of, these UX things, put three benefits, or B B Benji said, but change the button color, which like people talk about in like kind of marketing ecosystem or whatever. Those, if you're Amazon.com and you have millions of purchases a day and a lot of them are flippant purchases. How many times have you gone to Amazon for some random, you're like a razor, I need this thing. And it's like $14 and you're just like, should I just, uh, just buy now? You know, that's a flippant purchase. Those little UX friction things can make a difference, right? Because you're just like, it just you just quickly do it and you're like, ah, forget it. Like, you know, this rattan stool is arriving for our porch or something like that. <laughs> and it's like $30 or something anyways. But if you're deciding what company to reach out to for enterprise human resources software or something, do you think people care what color the button is? Like, do you know how much work goes into that decision? Hence our entire agency where you're like Googling. And like, I have seen people online talk about our bottom of the funnel technique being like, that is too flippant. That the actual like purchase of enterprise sales is not, or software or whatever, like B2B software is not just like Googling, you know, best IT security, whatever. People have said like, no, it's like years of like cultivating them. That stuff doesn't matter. It, it can't look, don't get me wrong. I have done these tests for these companies many years ago. There are times where you can get a statistically significant result, but it's hard. It's hard to do that over and over again. There often isn't like amazing low hanging fruit there, especially the tests I see people talking about online where you're changing a headline, you're adding three bullets, you're reducing the form fill. I'm sorry, like people, whether or not you have an additional field asking for number of employees or like industry or company size and removing it, that's not going to make or break whether your like large SaaS product grows or not. Like, you know what I mean? Um, it, it's not a flippant decision where these little UX details don't matter. So that's my qualitative explanation why versus in D2C e-commerce, where there are a lot more um, numbers. Amazon is an extreme example, you know, biggest e-commerce site in the world. 
but even some of the clients I have, like which are like branded sites or whatever, you can get the kind of numbers where they're doing thousands of transactions a month. And when each variation has 5,000 transactions in it, now we're talking. Now it's easier to get statistical significant data. So that's my rant, but I'm curious when you're saying you see people talk about this, are there some examples or? Yeah, well, I think, so I, I come from venture back startups and I think the culture in those companies is to test everything. And so oftentimes you'll hear CEOs who maybe are not educated as much on the marketing side as let's say you doing A-B testing as your career, that'll just say, we should test this. We, we should change the, the headline and test us. Or in regards to our own agency, we hear this a lot. Well, in, in a blog post, I, I should test which uh, conversion action I should use. Should I use like a, a button that says by, I, I don't know, sign up for a free trial. Should it be in the post? Should it be a pop-up? All these different things, let's test it. And what you're saying here is like largely that doesn't make sense because the site won't get enough traffic to do that. And so I just kind of want to pose the question back to you. I guess, does it really make sense for SaaS companies to AB test? Or you're saying probably unless you're in like the top 50 SaaS companies where they get. No, no, I can give you an even more quantitative specific criteria. Whatever the test idea you have, Look in your Google Analytics or whatever analytics in your backend system that's showing how many free trial signups you get, right? How many do you get per month? If the conversion metric you are using that, that you are testing, the thing you're trying to increase, free trial signups in your example, if that is less than 1,000 a month, I think your time is better spent elsewhere. Yeah, and, so what, and, what are all And if it's less than 500 a month, forget it. If it's less than 200 a month, forget it. Do not waste your time with it because of statistical significance, which I can get, show later. Yes, yeah, uh, then, then I'm just wondering, like, what are all these agencies doing, charging these massive retainers to these companies? I, it, they, it's the blind leading the blind. They, they show the test data. I've, I've seen this. Oh, my God. Now you're getting me really worked up. For one of my active... No, it was a client we had like, you know, last couple of years, not active anymore. They hired, I don't want to name drop this because I don't want the company to like sue me, but they hired a like name brand top consulting company, like a consulting company. And they said, Davis, here, here are some old like email threads that are active right now about the tests that are live on the system today. And I like just got hired and I looked at it and I saw an email thread where they said, this test is a winner to my client. Do you want me to create a ticket for your IT team to roll it out permanently? And I immediately replied to that email to just my client and said, hold the phone. That is absolutely not a winner. I, I'm going to say this part as honestly as I can, but I, you know me. I have the memory of a small rodent. I don't remember the exact number, but emotionally, I remember it was on the order of something like one of the variations had like 14 conversions. And the other variation had like six. It was <laughs> 14 and six. That has I, I, not... I mean, historically, I've, I've run tests like that because, again, being in, in the marketer's shoes, you're told to go A-B test something. You sign up for one of those A-B testing tools. And that tool, you, you, you set up the test and everything. And, yeah, you, you get some answer like this. Like, yeah, this one's a winner. You beat it out 20 and 18. And then you just go with that option. It, you're, you're saying that's not correct. And, it, and basically, if you were to run that test again, it, it could flip the other direction. And so you're, you're actually running the test again. You, you should not have stopped. It's not over. Like you, you, the test should have kept going. It's just not enough data. So here. So um, side note, I had to find this post. I Googled it. It's nice that Google AI overview just says, according to Growth Rock, you should rarely stop an A-B test before it's run for two calendar weeks. That's a good summary of my, my post. That's amazing that I wrote Growth Rock, when to stop an A-B test, and there's an AI overview for it. So let's click into this. This is the best example I have. Here, here is a test we ran for an e-commerce client. You ready for this? So I will read it out to people who are listening on the podcast. I'm showing a screenshot of A-B test data. 
from the popular testing program VWO, Visual Website Optimizer. And there's two variations, control and the variation. The control has, we're talking about, what did I say? 14 versus six. The control has 89 conversions on 3,000 visitors. Both of the control and variation have about 3,000. The control has 3,000 visitors. At the time I took the screenshot, the variation has 2,900 basically. The control has 89 conversions. The variation is 65. If you just divide these numbers, 89 divided by 3,000, 65 divided by 2,900, it's 2.96 for the control and 2.27. So it is, the control is up by 30%. That's the difference between 2.96% conversion rate and 2.27. That's a 30% higher conversion rate for one of your two variations. And everyone who's watching the screen share can see 95% statistical significance in green from the AB test software. What is the catch? This is an AA test. There is no difference in the variation. I just clicked run without actually changing anything in the variation. And that's 89 to 65. And people are, I literally saw a brand name consulting company tell my client a multi-million dollar revenue a year e-commerce brand. Let's, this test is done. It's a winner. Run it. Like, like implement it at 100%. And the conversions per were something on the order of like the teens or less, I remember. This is what people do. So that, that, so to answer your question, that's what people are charging them for. They're, they're just calling tests early and the client has no idea. The client doesn't care about these statistics. They're just like, Davish, is this a winner or not? They're just like, is this going to increase my conversion rate or not? And so they feel like job well done and everyone's patting themselves on the back and it's and then you run test after test, you implement them, and then someone high up says, huh, we've been working with this AB testing company for a long time. Why hasn't our actual conversion rate increased that much? That's the answer. For those businesses then, what would you recommend doing instead? So obviously the, these companies want to increase their conversion rate. AB testing doesn't sound like a good option. Like I know something historically that I've done in the past is use surveys or open-ended form questions like throughout the checkout process or something like that just to get feedback in terms of what people think about the page how they're perceiving things and you can use patterns in those responses to then go change website copy or go change pricing or different different aspects of whatever you're trying to improve yeah so this is a great question. There's a lot of ways to answer this. I want to do something kind of fun. While you're asking the question, I had this idea. Um, we just recorded, and I don't know in what order the videos are going to come out, but we recorded one of our, okay, so we recorded our monthly update, our last monthly update for May um, earlier. And we just showed that we felt like, basically that's not important. We showed that the last few um, months, the number of non-junk leads we were getting at Grow and Convert, reaching out to us for content marketing help, was on the order of eight, nine, and eight. So you're a co-founder of Grow and Convert, you're a marketer, let me ask you. So at those numbers, eight, nine, and eight, if we said we want to increase the number of leads or the conversion rate, what, what would you do? Because sh we sure as hell shouldn't be A-B testing anything. Like that's eight, nine, and eight total. So per variation would be four, somewhere in four to five, right? You're not going to see anything. Well, one of them gets four, the other gets five. That's a 20% increase. Like it's nonsense. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's two small numbers. Like, uh, I don't know. I, w I wouldn't know the difference in what we did each of those months that would have led to the-, the No, but then your point. question comes back and, and you uh, can say you answer it first. I can answer it first. I have plenty of answers, but the question becomes, if, if you're the CMO of a company like this and the CEO, let's say I'm the CEO like Benji, like increase the conversion rate or increase whatever, like what, what would you do? I mean, I would look at what channels are driving those leads and then probably invest more in those areas. That yes. Okay. Way. So stop. So that is what you said is actually a dramatic change in plan, in strategy level. Forget tactics. What you said is... I would increase traffic and I a hundred percent agree with you, but like, so that's number one. The number one thing I would do 
is I would realize that conversion rate isn't what pays the bills. I try to say this to clients. Conver like there's someone in who someone, I, I apologize, I should be crediting someone, but again, everybody who listens to this knows my memory. Someone said it should be called revenue optimization because conversion rate doesn't matter. If I told you I could get you free television ads at the Super Bowl, this is kind of a silly example. I'd get you a free Super Bowl ad. Um, who would say no to that? Even like we're not even, we're not a consumer facing business. It doesn't make sense to market our business on, on the Super Bowl. But if someone told me that, I'd be like, hell yeah, I'll record a grow yeah, and convert ad I, for the Super I, Bowl. I would do that 100%. Yeah. Oh, who wouldn't, right? By definition, that is going to crater our conversion rate. Because you're going to get a 10 million people who are like, who's grow and convert? And they'll Google it. They're going to grow and convert. The vast majority of which have are have they don't know what content marketing is. They're not going to hire a content marketing agency. That's an absurd example. But even if you sold something that a lot of people know, you sell I don't know accounting software like QuickBooks. Most people know what that is. And if you got a free um, Super Bowl ad, no one's going to say no to that. Your conversion rate will drop to the floor, but it's still good. Why? Because even if the conversion rate drops because a flood of people watching the Super Bowl came here. That no one conversion rate does not pay anyone's bills. It's conversions. It's customers. It's the total. It's the total that matters. So where Benji's instinct went is the correct place, in my opinion, is that if someone's like, we have a very low, con the, the total raw number of conversions is low, and someone in the company is talking to you about conversion rate optimization, your first step should be to reframe the conversation to, we just want to get more leads. <laughs> we just want to get more free trials total. Who cares about the rate? What channel is getting it? Have we exhausted that channel? That's the number one thing to do. So, so that's like the first, and you could say, Hey, that, that question dodges the answer. Sure. Well, okay. I, I think that's actually very important to drive that point home because I, I actually don't think many people think like that. Like, like from maybe, maybe the, maybe the marketers do, but people outside of marketing, they, they do think about the conversion rate and they think that's the number that you need to move the needle on in order to drive more conversions. And it's like, it's not wrong because your total conversions is that multiplied by traffic. Those are the two numbers, traffic times a some percentage equals the total, you know, yeah, but, but as, like, as we've done in, as we've seen on our work, like in the SEO conversion rate post that we have on our site, there's certain posts that convert at 14%, 25%, but the volume for that keyword is, is fairly low. So even if we were to increase that conversion rate, another 10% somehow, it's really not going to affect the overall numbers. And so that, oh, that's, the, the, that, that's where your point comes in. Yes. And then that leads me to like my second part of this answer. So then you can say, okay, fine, fine. We'll increase traffic, but still, how do I, you know, conversion rate is half of that formula. Traffic times conversion rate equals total conversions. So that's fine. You can say like, that's fine, Benji, like we'll increase the traffic part, but do you have any other ideas to increase the rate? Okay. Number one place I would go is channels because, and you made a great point. What we've noticed in SEO and the whole thesis of the growing convert strategy to a large extent is the way to increase conversion rate of blog content or SEO content, content, written content is not to do on page stuff like put a little banner in the middle of your blog post saying like request a demo or sign up for a free trial or whatever. It is, we noticed, to write more content for keywords where there is intent. So the highest way to affect conversion rate is actually to just have a larger fraction of your traffic mix come from high intent traffic. It's kind of like the first answer to some extent because you could be like, well, like, you know, again, like that's all fine and good, but you're not going to say no to the Super Bowl ad. It's going to tank your conversion rate, but like, you'll just say yes to it. it. Those are kind of two ways to come at the same answer, which is saying like, it doesn't, conversion rate really doesn't matter like by itself as a metric. It's it kind of reminds me of people who are like, guys, our bounce rate is really high. Like, what do we do about that? And you're just like, what? Like, why do you care? Like, are you, are you getting leads? So that's one. And then if you still are like, no, no, I really want to like optimize, optimize my on-page stuff, my answer is going to be, and I'll get into the nuance of this, but the blanket statement is 
go for big swings. Go for meaningful changes. Forget all the stereotype cliche stuff you read on the internet. Forget the button colors. Forget anything that you would bucket into um, UX. And in fact, here, this is a little bit of shameless plug, but I, we're not using this podcast to sell growth rock. So just don't, this is not about selling growth rock, but I will say my honest opinion, which is here, is we've created this, in, a growth rock, the A-B testing agency. I created this idea called like a purpose framework where I said every A-B test has some idea behind it. It's purpose of how it's supposed to increase conversion rate. So this is all geared towards e-commerce, which is grow and convert can do e-commerce, but that's not the majority of our client base. Um, it's, it's SaaS stuff, but, or B2B, let's say, um, go for the big things that you think matter. Benji talked about like, like go for the headline tests, go well, for, we, we can talk about even ourselves. We, we've completely revamped our homepage. We've revamped positioning. And the, those were the big swings for us at times where we felt like maybe our message wasn't resonating as much or our leads had fallen and like everything else had stayed constant. Then we're like, okay, is there something else wrong? Did we maybe get our positioning wrong? And we, we changed the messaging on our homepage. We changed a lot of the design elements and then we put that new version out there and we just kind of tracked, are we getting more leads or less? Is traffic? Yeah, we didn't A-B really test any of that. We didn't yeah. do a proper A-B test. We just did the old fashioned thing, which is make the change and look at the metrics. Yeah, and, and get feedback from people. And we, we had an example of, switching our whole positioning and messaging over skewing way more towards the SEO side of things where historically and, and currently we're more positioned as a content marketing agency who's known for really high quality content. And we went way more onto the SEO side of things and it really commoditized our service and, and made it less differentiated by making that change. How did we realize that? Well, we started talking to leads and and noticing that the conversations that we were having with those leads were not as good. We were getting lumped into conversations with agencies that we normally don't compete with. And a lot of that feedback from th those calls led us to think, okay, maybe our homepage changes actually did us a disservice. Like the quality of leads has gone down. Even, even the number may have increased or, uh, even just stayed constant, but we weren't closing as many deals. And, and that those conversations and getting the feedback from the people that were coming in is what led us to know that there was a, a problem in, in all these changes that we had updated on our site. And so then we changed it back. Well, the test everything crowd would then be like, well, but you guys don't really know if your overall lead numbers per month were due to that change because you did not isolate that. So just to back up for people listening to this, the whole point of A-B testing, when I say we didn't A-B test it, we just changed it. When we say that, what do we mean? An A-B test, we, we probably should have said this at the beginning, but that's fine, is a simultaneous, in parallel, like in time, there are two variations of a page live. What's happening is every time someone goes to that page, the code on the page instantly as it's loading picks whether they're an A or B, randomly assigns them, and then loads the HTML and CSS for that variation. And then the test software in the back end is recording how many people that were bucketed in A converted, how many people that were bucketed in B converted. But the key to A-B tests from like, why, why is it a thing? Why do people use it? And why is it genuinely useful for companies that do have the traffic for it? By the way, like I'm, I literally have an A-B testing firm. I'm not scamming people of money. Like there is a use for it. I'm just saying the majority of companies, especially non like D to C facing companies just don't have the traffic for it to be statistically useful. But like, it's a thing. And why is it so useful? Because it eliminates time flux, natural time fluctuations in conversion metrics. So you take an e-commerce example. If you have a flower shop and you don't do A-B testing, and you have something and right in February, 14 days before Valentine's Day, you make a site change and then you're like, These, this month's sales are crazy compared to last month. You're obviously an idiot, right? Because like, it's just Valentine's Day. The whole point of A-B testing is regardless of, that's an extreme example, but there's, there's very much more common examples. There is natural like um, seasonality. We worked with a swimsuit shop 
you can imagine March through June is massive and actually like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, November and all was like no traffic because nobody buys swimsuits in, in the winter and fall, right? We, we have an, a paid ad client right now that sells boat parts and this is like peak season or it was a few months ago or whatever. There's also things like your um, ad stuff goes up and down, coupons, you do like an influencer campaign or like all these stuff cause sales to go up and down and wildly. While you're doing that, you can run these two variations simultaneously saying that is happening to both variations because every day people are randomly being bucketed in both. That's the whole point. So the A-B test everything crowd would fight back against what Benji said that we did on our site and say, okay, sure, you guys took these big swings and changed your headline and positioning of the agency as a content, like high quality content agency versus an SEO agency and you made these conclusions, but you don't really know because you didn't A-B test. So these natural like, you know, economy, VC funding drying up, like inflation, overall investment, those things could have affected stuff. My answer is, you're right. <laughs> like it could have, but what else are we gonna do? When we're getting eight to 10 leads a month, there is no option to A-B test. This is the only thing you can do. If you try to A-B test, then you're just risking reading into nonsense noise. Whereas at least in the method Benchy described, you're using qualitative feedback to at least give you something reasonable, like a reasonable data point instead of seven versus three. It's just nonsense. And you risk being like this variation one because that random month, like four more people who already were coming in because they wanted to convert happened to be bucketed into this variation. And then that variation looks like it has seven versus three. It's like seven versus three, that's double, <laughs> you know? Like that's double, you're like 100% increase. It's just nonsense. So what Benji's saying is use qualitative stuff. You say, step back. What are the big things that affect people requesting a demo for our enterprise HR software? Why do people choose us? Why should they choose us versus Workday versus Oracle, right? You need to have that conversation so that the, the B that you're testing because you know you don't have raw statistics, you're not Amazon, sorry, you can't get that statistical significance. But at least then you, you have something else where you're like, I'm testing something that I, I'm testing a new headline and new homepage angle where we emphasize the our savings of our employees instead of our cost benefit. Just like pick a new benefit to position around. You know that that's a substantive thing. And even better is what Benji said, you got that information from listening to client calls or whatever. And like you got it from the customer's mouth. So like you need to replace what the raw statistics could do if you were a, just got more numbers with meaty, like substantive qualitative things that you know are likely to make a difference. Then you measure and, and do multiple months. Don't risk the Valentine's Day example. Be like, what, what, what was it last month versus when we released? What was it last quarter versus when we released? What about the last year? Like, try to give yourself a bunch of numbers to be like, can I convince myself that this is higher? And if you can't, and if it all just kind of looks the same, don't feel bad. That means like, it didn't really make a difference. Then go bark up another tree, right? Then try to increase traffic and all. Because some people come back and be like, we'll see. It's just a wash because the quarterly and yearly data, you, you know, you didn't see a difference, whereas A-B test could have. No, we've concluded from the beginning, you didn't have the numbers to A-B test anyway with statistical significance. So just, leave, just, just stop thinking about that. Like you can't do it. So then if you make a big change, what you think is a big change, what you think is a meaningful change with qualitative data backing you up, and you still cannot convince yourself in the numbers that it's made a difference, then it hasn't made a difference. <laughs> or it hasn't made enough of a difference to matter. Then just pick the one that you guys feel like makes the most sense from a brand perspective and then try to bark up another tree to make a difference. And that goes back to the first point that you and I both agreed on and made, which is in the end, it doesn't, the conversion rate doesn't matter. It's the total conversions. No, I just think that's the biggest thing that stood out to me from everything that you said that I resonated with is, is people are asking the wrong question. They're, they're asking the question how to increase conversion rate to, to increase revenue when they should just be asking the broader question, how should I increase revenue? 
And I think you'll, you'll come to, you'll come to different conclusions asking the, how do I increase revenue? than you will on the conversion rate side. But so many people are so obsessed with conversion rate as the way, as the number one lever to pull to increase the revenue side of things. And I think that's, it's largely just a function of AB testing, maybe coming from the e-commerce world where there's instant transactions like that. And that's a lever you can pull in that space. And now it got automatically applied to all these different industries and, and said, oh, SaaS is, is, yeah, you're checking out online. So you should use the same kind of thinking in order to affect change there as e-commerce. And it's just not the same. Yeah. It reminds me of the story. We had an A-B testing client last year. It was a consumer electronics, like audio speakers and, 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 and that kind of thing. And, um, it was a brand that like a lot of people in that space would recognize if you're into audio, like you'd recognize some of those brands. They got a bunch of traffic to their site because people have some of that equipment from like the seventies, you know, people are like really into like music. They got like some old school, like thing from like the eighties and seventies. So they got a bunch of traffic to their product pages, looking for manuals of like decades old products. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, um, but the leadership was like our convert. They literally, this is not a joke. The leadership reached out to some large e-commerce platforms and said, what are your average conversion rates in consumer electronics? And that e-commerce platform gave them a number and they were like, we are under below, we're below industry averages. So you guys like need to do a better job. We need to increase our conversion rate to the industry averages. And I was like, sorry, you guys are one of the biggest brands in the industry that's been around for decades. People come to look up the manuals of their old products from 1980 that still work because they're like classic collectibles. There is nothing wrong with that traffic, but that traffic is not gonna buy. They're just looking for the manual of their old product. That's good, you have this amazing brand where people keep products from like the 80s. They like sell it on like Craigslist and whatever. And like, it's like, imagine like Rolex probably, I don't know, but I'm guessing Rolex has some archive pages of just like their old models or whatever. And they get a bunch of people going in there because they're like trading watches on these like watch forums and all. I, I got into watches for like a month during COVID because I had nothing else to do or whatever. And then I was like, I I'm way too cheap to buy this stuff. But anyway, <laughs> so like I know them, like there's nothing wrong with that. That traffic will not buy or at least not going to buy at a high rate because they're not looking to buy a new Rolex on Rolex.com. But then some leadership person is like, we're under, under the industry standard for jewelry. And you're like, homie, like you're like one of the best brands. <laughs> like It's okay. Well, it, it kind of goes back to just our point, even on pain point SEO and just why, like why we have the strategy that we do. Not all traffic is created equal. If someone's coming to your site to do research, they don't have buying intent. And so traffic from those queries or various sources might have a lower conversion rate. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean those sources are bad or those pages on your site are bad. It's just a function of what that person is trying to achieve on your site is very different from someone coming in with the mindset that I'm going to purchase. Yeah. Here's another example that actually is relevant. Um, ad, ad, oh man, you, you found quite the topic to get me riled up. I was having a really peaceful day and then we recorded this and now I'm getting so mad. That's <laughs> like um, ad channels. And, and I'm going to say it for e-commerce, but it applies to SaaS too. Like um, we had, Someone asked this, another client, this came up where they're like, well, they're, they're mad that like the number, the raw conversion rate number is this percent and they want it to be in that percent. And I was so mad that they were like, basically in a way, like kind of like, you know, ripping on, on my work on, from the AB testing agency. And I was like, okay, then stop all display ads because display ads for this brand are so cheap. I don't know if anyone's looked at this. If you looked at this display, meaning you're buying ads with those, like literally like you know, like the banner ads on the side yeah, of like, like news articles, New York times at the very bottom, you're, you're seeing like images show up and yeah, it's like just, it, it's like fractions of a cent on like thousand dollar CPMs. And like, it's just, it's like a, a tiny, it's so cheap compared to, you know, a Google ad for, you know, blah, blah, blah software. That'll be like $12 a click or some absurd amount S search us search ads, right? Or, or even like LinkedIn, like, you know, these brands will do LinkedIn ads, it'll be $13 a click. So the display ads bring a ton of traffic because you do the same amount. You put $2,000 a display versus $2,000 a Google. Google will give you a hundred visitors and display for that could give you 20,000 visitors. And I said, shut off the display ads. 
There's 20,000 visitors. It converts at like some tiny fraction because who's reading random news articles and is like, yeah, I'm going to buy this right now. And my point of contact said, Davish, I'm not going to shut those off. He was on my side, by the way. He was also trying to push back on leadership. And he said, I'm not going to shut those off because even though the conversion rate is tiny, they're so cheap that I'm getting positive return on ad spend. And I was like, this is our case in point. Like, this is an extremely low converting ad channel when you look at conversion rate, but he literally is like dollars in and dollars out still makes sense for me. I'm not going to turn it off. The answer is stop worrying about conversion rate. It doesn't matter that that thing is not high converting channel. This is true. This is a more realistic example. And this is true for so many businesses. It's like each channel you should be evaluating in the end in dollars, in sales, in revenue. And then what was the dollars in to create that channel? That's it. Your overall site con conversion rate is some blend of all of those channels, but does it matter? And that goes back to that Super Bowl ad example, which was an extreme version of this. But that's that example. You, no one is going to say no to the Super Bowl ad, but it's going to tank your conversion rate. It doesn't matter that it tanks your conversion rate, right? And so, yeah, so, that, so anyway, so that, that, that's a classic um, example. I don't know if we want to get into me. I think just do three to five minutes of this screen share to show this tool because now we've given all the argumentation. I would love for you to just share the data because I don't even know this stuff. Yeah, so in conversion rate, go to any conversion rate um, calculator. I happen to use this one, which is, I probably shouldn't have shared it, but it's just the one I use like every week anyways. Um, it's a little bit more obtuse, but if you just type AB test calculator, there's others that'll do it in a little bit cleaner way. There's really just um, a couple things you wanna do. So, it, and I'm saying this scenario, before you run the test, go to these calculators and put in realistic numbers just using your GA. So let's go back to a concrete example. We were talking at the beginning of like some SaaS company that's using free trial signups as a, as a thing, okay? So let, let's actually start blank. And I'll walk through what all of these numbers mean and which ones you have to care about, okay? Let's start blank. First thing you look at is the metric you are trying to increase. In that extent scenario, we start free trial signups. So look in your GA for the past few months, what is your average per month? Why do I do per, per month, by the way? Because... I don't want to get into this level of detail, but like just estimate that you're probably going to want to run a test for like four weeks. It could be two, it could be longer, whatever. Just like assume a month, it's easy. So look at the last six months of data. Let's say it's 500 conversions per variation. That's a lot, 500 free trials. Maybe it's 100. If it's 100, put 50 and 50 in the conversions for A and conversions for B. Just split it evenly for now. Then, Think about the, the page on which you want to um, make a change. So if it's like the page on which they sign up for a free trial, a very common thing leadership will tell you, oh, we want to increase free trial conversion rate, then that page where they literally like slash sign up or whatever, you want to test that. Look at how many unique visitors, not page views, unique visitors you get per month on average. Users, I think, in the new GA terminology. Right. 10,000, let, let's say you're getting 10,000 total. So that's actually, you would put in each one 5,000 each, okay? Now, if we run this, obviously there is no difference in conversion rate, but let me just use that to illustrate because we literally put 5,000 visitors in A with 50 conversions, 5,000 visitors in B with 50 conversions. So that is a 1% conversion rate, 50 divided by 5,000. On each side, the relative uplift is zero. We put it in that way. Out of all these other numbers you see at the bottom, sorry to the podcast folks, p-value is the only number you really need to care about um, for now. In general, is, is it? That's, the in, that's one minus statistical significance. So p-value of 0.5 means 50% stat sig. Use the industry standard, aim for 95. Hell, just 90. Here is what this number means um, on, in English qualitatively. So one, so this is a set bad example because it's 0.5. So one minus it is also 0.5. But anyway, it means 50% of the time you can get a result like this from an AA test is what that means. So if we change this from 50 to each to some drastic difference, 80 and 20 still adds up to a hundred. Okay. Now one of them, the one that has 80 conversions converts at 1.6%. The other one at 20 conversions converts at 0.4%. That's a 75% decrease. It's showing a p-value of one. 
that means like 99.999% significance, okay? That means basically a tiny fraction of the time, multiple nines, it shows four digits here, so 0.0001% of the time, when you run an AA test, due to natural, if it has just a total natural bell curve, less than a fraction of a percent of the time would you just get this by chance? Which means that's a statistically significant result. Right, and I did the A having more, so you can get this thing to light up if you do the B having more. It says like, yay, green, like your B variation increased stuff by 300% or whatever. Let's make it a little bit more difference. Let's do 40 and 60. A difference of 20 raw conversions between the two. That's a 50% increase, 0.8 to 1.2%. And that p-value now says 0 0.02. You take one minus that, it means 98% statistical significance. What that means is, this 0 0.02, that 2% of the time, if you run an AA test, you could get a result like this at 5,000 per. Industry standard is 95, meaning 5% of the time, a p-value of 0 0.05. So this is also really good. This would be a valid test result. Again, keeping in mind the Growth Rock article of you can get 95% plus even on an AA test if you just don't run it for long enough. And this is the frust It's a frustrating thing about... about um, a-B testing is you're probably going to ask, well, then what is 95% even relevant? No, I, I was going to ask, you said at the very beginning, I wouldn't even do A-B testing if I got less than a thousand conversions a month. So here you're saying you can get a, the, the proper p-value in this test, even with a hundred conversions. So yeah, you can, you can get a proper p-value, but the reason I'm not doing a thousand is because of results like this. This shows 95%. But I just know that a difference of what's 89 minus 65 is something on the order of like 15 or something is it's just 15 raw conversions. This is 20 raw conversions. Like random chance can affect that. But at 1,000, if we said 400 versus 600 and you're like, I ran this for three weeks and there's 200 extra conversions on B, the chances of that being random are low. Got it. Okay. So it's just the pure number is so low that the there's a lot of probability that random chance is playing into that difference. Yeah, and that's why this article is called the three or four safeguards to stopping an A-B test. And the thesis of the article is people think once you hit 95%, just hit stop. Many people, not just me, by the way, many people in the A-B test CRO world have written similar articles. This is my version of it. This is not, the, many people have said this. You can't just stop based on 95% because of this exact example that I showed is that you can get this at tiny numbers because all the 95% is showing or doing is saying at these exact numbers, how many times, what percentage of chances an AA test would produce the same thing. But like real life doesn't work like that. Like, you need to run, like plan to run it for three weeks, plan to run it for at least two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and then try to get hundreds of conversions per variation because then the likelihood that, you know, you're seeing just nonsense when there's a difference of 200 raw conversions is low. Like, I hate to say it, but use your gut instinct. If the difference is 15, even if the calculator says 95%, if it's 15 raw conversions, you just know by instinct that could change next month. Like, I just looking at my stats, I know that 15 just comes and goes. And so, like, forget it. Like, an hour, an hour thing, right? Like, you know, let's say we make this 1,000 each in our like, you know, lead form, or, or, or let's say overall site traffic, 10,000 each, we got a decent amount of site traffic. And what was it, eight and four? So one, one of them does two, and the other one does six, or whatever. That's a 200% increase, and it's on the order. It's like 93, 92% stat sig. But you and I just know, just in our gut, that it's just four leads. Next month, they could change. So use just like a general rule of expect hundreds each. Try, try to get like 200 each minimum, you know, and don't worry about stat sick. Like, yes, worry about stat sick, but don't let that be the only thing. If you're less than like a couple hundred conversions per variation, be very, very dubious, or you need to see huge changes to be convinced. And at that point, you could have just, you could have just launched the variation and probably seen it in your GA data as it is. Yeah, so then, so then to summarize here, the issue with this is just you're leaving a lot up to random chance. And so the agencies that are doing this, yeah, you might come up with the, the statistical significance that says this is the winning test. But when you actually implement it from a revenue standpoint, it's not really going to move the needle because 
there's a lot of just variability in the data essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That all those things do those, that AB test number, the 95% or whatever, it means if there is just this natural Gaussian curve, I'm, I'm trying not to be too analytical, but like there's just a natural bell curve distribution between two sets of data. What's the percent overlap that they'll have on certain amounts or whatever. But like, Real life doesn't work like that. Like random stuff could happen in your ad send. Your, your, your competitor could be running a sale or like got a bunch of good press and you get barely any data. And like weird things could happen where people are just fluctuated. Like use common sense and gut instinct and then use just a general rule of like hundreds of conversions per variation to, to feel more confident in addition to, yes, look for 95% statistical significance. But if the actual raw numbers are low, be very, very um, skeptical of it being reliable. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe. You can also get the audio only versions of these shows wherever you get your podcasts. And you can follow us at growandconvert.com newsletter for any articles and updates for when these videos come out.